I'm Drutter, and today is November 14th, 2016. From time to time, we all experience physical pain, which in layman's terms is an unpleasant sensation caused by illness or damage to the body. Pain can be useful. If we step on the tip of a sharp nail, a nerve signal alerts us to stop. But sometimes, pain stops being useful and can even become a source of health problems itself, as in the case of chronic or ongoing pain. Most of us have experienced pain bad enough that it kept us awake at night or caused poor sleep quality, whether it was a headache, an injury, muscle or joint pain, or neuropathic pain, pain originating in the nerves. If that happens enough times, we call it insomnia. This happens because our pain receptors connect to our brain's arousal center, causing painful stimuli to stop us from being able to sleep. It simply hurts too much to sleep, even though we may not have any other common causes of insomnia, like caffeine intake, a noisy sleep environment, or fluctuating blood sugar levels. Normally, sleep replenishes the neurotransmitters, or brain chemicals, that shut off our pain receptors. So if a person's insomnia gets bad enough, they'll begin to experience pain even if they're not injured, and any pain they experience will be more intense than if they've been getting adequate good quality sleep. Since pain makes it very hard to sleep, and we need sleep to heal and shut off our pain receptors, people sometimes get into a vicious cycle involving both conditions. This is one mechanism for developing chronic pain. There are other chronic condition pairs that can lead to vicious cycles. A well-known one is depression and anxiety, both of which have become extremely prevalent in today's society. Clinical depression, or even just prolonged low mood, often brings about a negative outlook and focus on problems, leading to stress. Other causes of anxiety are past traumas in the form of PTSD or current stressors such as safety, family, social, and financial. Regardless of the cause of anxiety, large amounts of stress hormones are released into the bloodstream, which break down the hippocampus, part of the brain responsible for memory and regulation of mood. By weakening our hippocampus, anxiety can lead to depression, and a negative focus caused by low mood can raise anxiety. Both depression and anxiety can occur in a person without the other, but when they occur together, they reinforce each other in a vicious cycle and can become chronic, comorbid conditions. In addition to losses and isolation, depression can be exacerbated by insomnia, since sleep resets our levels of neurotransmitters important in mood, such as dopamine and serotonin. Insomnia leads to depression, but does depression also feed back into insomnia? Yes. Trouble sleeping is a common complaint of the depressed. One reason is that depression weakens the frontal lobe, making it harder to shut off stimulating thoughts. We already saw how pain and insomnia interact as a comorbid pair. Could pain also cause or be caused by depression or anxiety? Absolutely. Pain especially chronic pain, and depression are seen together incredibly often. Perhaps you've known someone who, let's say, threw his back out at work. Maybe he's off long term or had to retire early. You might hear him say, my back hurts so much I can't enjoy my life. Or maybe something like, when I feel this low, everything hurts even more. How about an anxious older lady with arthritis? She might say, my hands and hips hurt too much for me to relax, and indeed we know that chronic pain puts stress on our adrenal glands. When she gets anxious, her arthritis gets worse, and neurology shows that stress hormones like cortisol bind to and activate the pain nerves. Anyone who's caught in this self-reinforcing comorbid cycle of chronic depression, anxiety, pain, and sleeplessness is very likely to become fatigued. This is because depression slows nerve transmission, poor sleep depletes energy reserves, and anxiety causes the adrenal glands to underproduce cortisol during the day. 
Some other common causes of fatigue, which is a deep and lasting exhaustion, are poor or inadequate nutrition, overexertion, and certain viral infections. When fatigue gets bad enough, the person barely has energy for the basic necessities of life, and certainly none to spare on recreation, fun, or socialization. Have you ever been up late at night, too stressed to fall asleep? Or woke up halfway through the night with your heart pounding or mind racing? When we have anxiety, our adrenal glands often overproduce stimulating stress hormones like cortisol, ruining our chances of a restful sleep. Any one of these diagnoses can become chronic on its own, but because of the way all five contribute to and reinforce each other, they establish a very powerful comorbid condition almost impossible to break out of. It causes permanent damage to the nervous system and quality of life, and when not treated properly, progressive degeneration of health. Unfortunately, fibromyalgia affects as many as 1 in 30 men and 1 in 10 women. The most common age range it appears in is between 35 and 50, but it can strike anyone. When fibromyalgia was identified as a distinct condition, it was believed the origin of the characteristic symptom, pain, was the muscles themselves. That's why the name, which means muscle fiber pain, is actually a misnomer. Fibromyalgia is now shown to be a disorder of the nervous system, and muscles are just where most of the symptoms are felt. The symptoms of fibromyalgia, like the symptoms of the common diagnoses that contribute to it, are mostly invisible. Just looking at a person, or even running lab tests on a sample of their blood, you normally wouldn't be able to tell if they're sleeping well, how much pain they're in, what their mood's like, if they're stressed out, or how much energy they've got. The same goes for fibromyalgia. There are tiny physical changes in the nerves and brains of fibromyalgia sufferers, but the best way to diagnose it remains a comprehensive history taken by a professional who understands the condition. Some of the common symptoms are unexplained pain, tenderness, or aching in any or all parts of the body, tingling, pricking, numbness, itching, warm, cold, or wet sensations of the skin, heightened pain response to pressure, temperature, or light touch, muscle spasms or twitching, slowed thinking, trouble finding words, poor memory, concentration, attention, low mood, nervousness, bladder pain or hyperactivity, diarrhea or constipation, profound fatigue, weakness or stiffness in arms, legs, or jaw, impaired balance or coordination, and difficulty falling or staying asleep. These symptoms have a biological source. In people with fibromyalgia, the nociceptors all over the body discharge pain signals abnormally. As the signals travel to the brain, non-painful and mild signals aren't filtered out as they should normally be. In addition to this, many people with fibromyalgia have increased sensitivity in their pain receptive and emotional centers of their brain. Many people who develop fibromyalgia at one time experienced a concussion, a trauma or abuse leading to ongoing stress, or had relatives with fibromyalgia, diabetes, gluten intolerance, thyroid or gut problems. Developing a food intolerance or experiencing sudden traumas or overwhelming infections can trigger the onset of fibromyalgia in a susceptible individual. Some other related conditions that can be comorbid with fibromyalgia include peripheral neuropathy, diabetes, IBS, and autoimmune disorders like Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Despite the scientific understanding of fibromyalgia making huge leaps forward in the past five years, there is no cure. Treatment has traditionally been focused on managing the symptoms, but recently we find that treating the underlying cause of a person's insomnia, pain, fatigue, depression, and anxiety, preferably simultaneously, can greatly reduce suffering 
and sometimes knock fibromyalgia into remission. I'll go into the latest findings in treatment in an upcoming video. Because fibromyalgia is so multifactorial, affecting both the physiological and psychological aspects of the person, it tends to be misunderstood and misdiagnosed by both medical doctors and psychiatrists who focus on only one side. I spent a decade working in psychiatry and regret my handling of some patients I came across with a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Because the science behind the condition was still being done, I went along with the prevailing judgment, which was that these patients were imagining or faking their symptoms, or that they simply needed to try harder. Universities and research centers all over the world have now shown this couldn't be further from the truth, and new discoveries are constantly being made. Reading some of this research and putting out this video is my way of working through my own recent fibromyalgia diagnosis. Please take it not as medical advice, but as one person's current perception of a complex condition that can be tough to visualize. I've included below some links to resources to help you develop your understanding of the condition. My thanks goes out to Dr. Rutherford and Dr. Gates of Power Health Talk, who by sharing their experience treating and researching fibromyalgia, propelled my diagnosis and partial recovery. If I was as sick as I was a few months ago, I wouldn't be able to be making this video. I hope it helps somebody with fibro or who knows somebody with it and raises public understanding of this often debilitating condition. You're not crazy. There is something real going on in your nerves. And with the right treatment and lifestyle changes, you can start to feel better and even carry on with your life. If you know somebody who might have fibromyalgia, please pass this message on to them if you think it's useful.